unless your hands in this heads in the sand, if anyone who's following Roman Catholic scholarship, they would realize they regularly decontextualize. And it's not that we just care about what scholars think, because the, the truth of the matter is that all the bishops with their salt all have PhDs, right? They they are all academics in their own right. They all read um, academic texts, or at least they follow and hope to stay abreast of these things. And so when Roman Catholic scholars on a regular basis decontextualize um, history, my opinion is they unintentionally, it's not their intent, of course, but unintentionally trivialize their own doctrines. Now, here's a few famous examples. Yeah, I was going to say, let's let's define it and then tell us some examples. Can you give us just for the total novice here, what does the term even mean, decontextualization? Well, decontextualize would be to establish um, truth irrespective of how people came to it, right? So like... I don't know, in um, history, it would be like reading the Constitution and instead of interpreting the first uh, 10 amendments according to what the people who wrote them thought they meant, we would take maybe a living Constitution doctrine because um, there's jur uh, juridical doctrines, by the way, when it comes to uh, constitutional law, and be like, well, the meaning of the amendment could evolve over time. Mm -hmm. That decontextualizes what the words meant when they wrote them. Right. Mm. So people naturally and this is how, you know, this is what's good. Human nature is is good. And so people by nature think of truth in a highly contextual way without being academics. Right. They they believe what their husband or wife tells them because all the dots connect. Right. They don't just listen to words totally disconnected from everything else within their lives. And so the same way we read documents as connected to the people who wrote them when they write words, the, the words have intentions behind their meaning, um, which the authors in the historical context would determine. So it's it's really not complicated. It's just if you don't just take someone at the word, but you look at their facial expressions, you look at their actions, you look at the people they know, then you're looking at context as well in doing these things. And it's quite frankly, it's very bizarre because almost no one decontextualizes anything in real life. It seems like only abstractions and uh, intellectual ideas, people even dare decontextualize. Now, this is mainstream, I would say, like, majority stuff in Roman Catholic circles. Now, for a popular example is Eamon Duffy is comfortable with there being no original papacy. They go, wait a second, there's all these arguments that, you know, the Pope of Rome, he's necessary, he's not necessary, but yet the those serving on the Pontifical Commission you know, for these matters, don't even think there originally was a papacy. So how does that work? Um, Father Christian Copps, who's a head of a seminary in Pittsburgh, so he's, he's not a nobody, um, he asserts that the Council of Florence was subordinationist. Heretical, in other words. Right? But yeah, they were teaching a heresy. You know, so wait a second. So Orthodox didn't become Roman Catholic because they're teaching a, a heresy and they dogmatize something intending it to be a heretical, but somehow the Orthodox are wrong. Sounds very bizarre, but this is mainstream scholarship. Um, a scholar I particularly like, um, Benjamin Heidgerken, he's a seminary professor. He asserts that the Council of Trent's intended soteriolo soteriology requires reform in light of the teachings of St. Maximus the Damascene. And he's not as explicit about this, but he appears to imply the same about the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So it seems like for years, the Roman Catholic Church has made concessions, whether it's in the field of academia or in these joint commissions, on every important doctrine with the Orthodox. But I want to bring something to the audience's attention. In the last two examples of Duffy and Cops, there are two epistemic linchpins, all right, that makes their worldview work. And one is doctrinal development, and the other is infallibly dogmatized decrees are true despite what context was determined they were supposed to mean. All right, so I'm gonna repeat that again. Yeah, repeat that, because that's a really important thing for people to understand. I'm, I'm gonna repeat that again, because what we're gonna find is Orthodox in the modern day and age are doing this. And that's the real danger, because Some. look where this Some. leads. <laughs> it's that Doctoral development allows for this postmodernist uh, approach to these uh, church doctrines and the belief that all that matters, the only thing that's binding, the only thing that's non-negotiable, the only thing that our conscience must follow is the dogmatized decree 
not anything that informs the context of that decree. Mm. Now, I want to say, because the people following this on, the, on these YouTube channels, they follow apologetics. And the most popular Roman Catholic apologists are climbing atop each other to employ postmodernism to defend their beliefs. No, this now, is going to be very good. Very helpful. This is going to be very helpful. It's going to take it and put it right where we are. Most of us, we're not very familiar with all the ins and outs of the dialogue, but this is going to be real. And then we can go back to the dialogue and look at it again. Yeah, it's. I'm, I'm just aware, of, and I appreciate everyone's patience, the audience, that, uh, Father Peter, a, a lot of people that are that are hierarchs, that are priests, that are clergy, that are academics, do follow you and watch your stuff, whether for good or bad motives, whole other question. <laughs> um, and so I just want to come here just, you know, breathing fire. I want to demonstrate, like, no, this is something I've studied, and this is something that um, if you're well studied, you'll understand that what I'm saying is true. Yes. And so that's why we had to take this first 50 minutes to take the time to do that. But we're going to try to bring it more to uh, where people are at at this juncture. Now, recently on the issue of Nicaea II, there's all these arguments over whether icons are apostolic or not. And what amazed me was that Roman Catholic apologists like Trent Horn, who's a very nice guy, and Jimmy Akin, they appeared to concede to the Protestant polemicist that iconodulia was not a concrete apostolic Christian teaching, but a doctrinal development. And this not only was to me so embarrassing for their side, that then other Roman Catholic apologists were climbing top each other to make better and more nuanced arguments about the development of the doctrinal development of icons. And so the proceeding presumes similarly to Newman that something can at one period not exist at all and then later be dogmatized as necessary. But it, it, that flies in the face of the very decision of the Ecumenical Council, which, which clearly well, says this has always been the faith always been the practice of the church how could they are they ignorant of that or are they just well it's because everyone knows better than the uh conciliar fathers and what and i'm going to show now the conciliar fathers actually had a, a a very profound epistemology that's not oh if you're spiritual superman it's like even i think an atheist go wait no they make these guys make more sense um and it also helps that there are saints among them <laughs> that's a not more than a little bit of help so I just want to state if all that matters is a dogmatic decree, whether, you know, because these are Roman Catholic apologists from a papal ex cathedra statement or a ecumenical council, then one can utterly decontextualize anything. Okay, I mean, consider the following. I'm going to give two examples from two very popular Roman Catholic apologists who don't consider themselves postmodernists, but you're going to see now they are postmodernists, at least they are postmodernist leaning or adjacent. Now, Michael Lofton, who's the apologist behind Reason and Theology, LLC, he argues that ecumenical councils can err on matters of doctrine. So this is what, speaking to what you're just saying, Father Peter, that like, so they just don't believe the councils are right about this? Well, the answer is yes, they, they don't believe the councils are right. I'm going to now quote him. This is in his article, Understand the Magisterium. It's on ReasonTheology.com. Michael writes, Reforming the work of Chalcedon, the Council of Constantinople II said this letter to Maris was heretical. So people know the letter of Maris, um, letter to Maris uh, taught Nestorianism. It tried to save face for Chalcedon by saying that the Council Fathers must have read a different letter than the, than the letter to Maris. Clearly, there was some degree of reform between Chalcedon and Constantinople II on the letter of Maris, either... This is, again, I'm not saying this. This is Michael Lofton. Either Chalcedon judged it as orthodox, and this was overturned by Constantinople II, so meaning Chalcedon endorsed a heretical letter, or Chalcedon did not sufficiently express its judgment on the letter, and Constantinople II finished the job. Regardless of which theory one adopts, some element of reform has to be conceded. All right, so as we can see, Lofton leaves open one of two possibilities. One, an ecumenical council approved the doctrinal content of a letter declared heretical by a subsequent ecumenical council. Or two, Chalcedon was too obscure on the question. Perhaps some had historian sympathies and some participants did not, requiring further clarification. So as one can see, either of the proceedings put the attendant meaning of Chalcedon's decree on Christology in doubt, right? We The context surrounding Chalcedon, now it's like you got these crypto historians that are in the mix. If the fathers of Chalcedon were historians or had a strong historian contingent, 
So like they had to make the Nestorians happy and you know, throw them a bone here or there. Then the wrong. Oriental Orthodox are entirely justified in saying that the decree was heretical or worded as so as to permit for heretical interpretation. So ironically, it's the Oriental Orthodox objection that presumes upon the existence of that objective truth that words have meaning which are shaped by the attentions of those who author them. All right. I'm going to call that conciliar contextualism. I'm going to get more than that in a bit. You wanted to say something, Father. So no, 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 no. I'll, keep going. I'll shut up. <laughs> no, no, no. So, that's it. Keep going. It's great. So yeah. So like so again, it's the Oriental objection is very sensible if if the letter uh to Maris really was approved by the council. It's like, well, if you have these Nestorian sympathies, then that kind of throws everything you've done into doubt, into uh yeah, into um question. And that's really not wrong. That's just a common sense way of going at things. So Lofton, on the one hand, is obviously schooled in the thought process, the aforementioned scholars. So it's not just the scholars. It's these guys with 50,000 subscribers making tons of money off people on YouTube um, in good standing within the Roman Catholic Church. And he is not troubled that an ecumenical council could have intended to teach or cater in part heresy, just like Father Christian Copps is not bothered that subordinationism was intended by Florence, right? Not bothered at all, either of them. All that Lofton apparently holds is sure is the decree is true, right? Well, Chalcedon's decree is true, but had to be reformed in Constable 2 to make it correct, hmm. all right? So it, again, it's that's completely heterodox, but this is, according to postmodernism, a possible way of thinking. Of course, you would never work with your own family members and stuff in this way, as we established beforehand, but this is part of the zeitgeist. And so context ultimately has nothing to do with it, and Lofton is not alone. Now, consider Eric Yabara, who, hats off to him, is probably the most influential apologist on the question of the papacy vis-a-vis -vis orthodoxy who's alive today. So that means something, right? They were to write the history of this. Uh, Eric Yabara is part of it. God bless him. Now, for those consider, you know, concerned about his papacy book, I'm going to do a little plug. It's not being answered. Don't worry. By God's grace, my book, Rise and Fall of the Papacy, will be out in a few months. So don't worry about that. But it's going to be published by Uncommodin Press, I might add. All right, you just Father Father Peter, you just broke the news. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. It will be published soon, God willing. And and Rise and Fall of the Papacy will um, solve the question of the papacy and its historical dumb for scholars, clergy, and lady alike. Now let's consider how Yabara addresses the perceived difficulty. Um, in my published work on the Theotokos, um, I don't think this is an issue, but I'm not going to get into those details about the dating of these things. But Yabara addresses what he perceives the difficulty because he assumes that Theotokos' assumption probably wasn't documented until the 5th or 6th centuries because that is the, the majority scholar opinion, though there is a couple scholars that reject this, and, and I agree with that. Now, but what is Yabara's opinion? Because this pertains to popular postmodernism. He writes in his article in ericyourbauer.org, The Dogmatization of the Bodily Assumption of Mary and the Appeal to History. He writes this. However, the Catholic Church does not look at documentary texts in precisely that manner that documented evidence must exist, nor do they share what the Protestant assumes about their own paradigms of authority. What I mean here is this. Even if the first historical document detailing the celebration of Dormition slash the Assumption of the Virgin Mary was from the 11th century, it would not thereby entail that the Catholic Church has no basis for upholding the teaching of the Assumption as an apostolic teaching that is binding for all Christians. So as one can see, your Barbara presumes that all that matters is that the dogma was decreed, which by the way happened in 1950, right? So if no documented exists, evidence exists for 1,000 years and it's not necessary, well, then why not 1,900 years? In fact, what future dogmas may still lack any documented evidence of their existence today but will be dogmatized in centuries' time? And you must hold to them by that logic. So how does that even work to, to think? And again, it's not to insult them. It's the, it's the epistemology in such an absurd sense your bar decontextualizes dogmas from archaeological, liturgical, and written precedent that documents their existence from, a, from antiquity among all Christians. So what stands alone as important in his worldview is affected by more than a tinge of postmodernism, and that's the dogmatic decree. That's all that matters. 
Once it's been dogmatized, that's all that matters. Doesn't matter. There's no uh, documented evidence of, the, of its existence. Mm. And so the proceeding demonstrates that the epistemology undergirding the scholarship, which appears to bring concessions to the orthodox, right? Because I was saying before, well, orthodox saying, well, this ecumenism looks to be working for us, is the same epistemology which undergirds Roman Catholic polemicists who seek to convert orthodox members to their faith. It's the same epistemology. Mm. So postmodernism proves to be a double-edged sword. Can you uh, you little little more on that? Little unpack that a little bit. It's very. I think it's a huge point. And so it's been coined that the ideology of modern Roman Catholic apologetics, because most aren't going to just go, you know, and say, "Oh, I'm totally on board with everything Pope Francis does," and I'm totally on board with what the German bishops are doing it and the liberalism within the Roman Catholic Church. Most faithful Catholics, and that means most of the apologists, because why would you be defending a faith that you really didn't believe was correct, right, <laughs> um, are traditionalists. But what they find themselves doing is defending traditional ideas using postmodernist epistemology. And so they really shouldn't be called trads. All the trads are actually post-trads. They're postmodernist defending traditional Roman Catholic mm -hmm. ideas. Mm -hmm. All right? Now... I think in some respect, they shouldn't be blamed because the defects in the Roman Catholic epistemology could actually be identified to the ninth century. They were invented by um, a papal librarian named Anastasius, and he wrote most of the foreign correspondence for three popes that during the Photian Schism. He's a, mm -hmm. a, a figure of immense macrohistorical importance. I'm not going to get into a lot of details now, but if people want the origin of where this postmodernist view comes from, it's actually 12 centuries in the making. It didn't happen in the last 50 years. That would make sense, though, because if if much of what the the doctrine doctrinal development of the West uh, is is going to be based in 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 an approach that's that's you know predates or dates from the schism, it's going to be consistent methodology, not going to be something that just came along at the end. To give Anastasius credit, at least he invented and forged his historical evidence to give it a basis in reality instead of outright reinter reinterpreting things that so you know that on the face of it disagree with him. Mm. That's uh, that's that's very good work. Uh, very good work. Very good. Let's and go on. so, let's get into how what we just learned is going to pose potential problems in a couple years time in Nicaea or whatever follow up commission or council after that. Mm. What are we to do if Roman Catholic bishops and scholars show up in Nicaea? Because this is the modern day. They're not going to come alone. They're going to come with like First laymen. All, we, have, we have to tell people what's happening in Nicaea in 2025. There's going to be. Uh, yeah, get into that, Father. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. there is going to be a meeting. Uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople has already stated as much. The Pope has also confirmed that he's going to be there. And I know they're working on it within the Patriarchate. They're developing documents and they're going to very likely uh, have some kind of compromise on the Pascalian. And, and the Pope is going to join, I'm assuming, a lot of Orthodox, certainly not all the Orthodox, but a lot of the Orthodox in Nicaea in 25 for the 1,700-year anniversary of the Council of Nicaea. And it's very, very much expected there's going to be major compromises made, perhaps more. It's hard to say right now, we don't have any like hard fast evidence, but there's a lot of speculation. There's going to be a, a compromise on the Pascalian and maybe much more. We'll see, uh, God, you know, in due time. So that's that's what you're alluding to here. Yes. And what are we going to do when they show up and they have this postmodernist epistemology? Hmm. I suspect what a lot of Orthodox are going to have is a wait and see approach. Like, let's see if they bring the metaphorical olive branch or not. And this is not good enough, in my opinion, because people could bring an olive branch and say this was a big misunderstanding. We never believed um, um, the same thing. We have to look past our differences, right? You know, the differences on papalism and on uh, synodical ecclesiology. That's that's as old as the second century of Pope Victor. There's, we've been looking past each other the whole time. Maybe we just got to look past each other again. However, what prevents not only what what happens not only to the principle of the Orthodox Church demanding Orthodox, I mean, that's what we're named after, but time inertia, right, from creating a doctrinal drift as the Orthodox would be outnumbered by those uh, with unaltered and heterodox beliefs, right? If we go with, let's just look past each other. 
this can't work because what's going to happen is it's going to be a current that's going to take us with it. And that that's unacceptable. Let me ask, let me ask uh, from my personal experience at the University of Thessaloniki, I was sitting down with a very well-known um, theologian who was involved in the, in the dialogue with Catholicism. He was on the commission at the time. And we were discussing the filioque and he was saying well you know he was saying look they don't understand that they don't understand the whole question of economy they're still it's still but 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 and there was a lot of buts and he said i said you know i don't understand this because it seems like we're moving ahead at a really fast pace what you're telling me from other things you've said to me moving ahead toward a union but we don't have a lot of things figured out and i gave him an example which he probably never thought of and that is that we have a a very robust and blessed development within Catholicism of Pentecostal uh, charismatic spirituality and and all of that, what's implied there in terms of our understanding of the Holy Spirit, the working of the Holy Spirit, and clearly there's a lot of heretical ideas that are floating around. And his his response was, we'll figure that out after the union. All right? We'll read the <laughs> bill after it's passed. Yeah, right. So I said, well, that's simply not going to work for the vast majority of people who are going to be living in places like America, where we're a tiny minority and the vast majority of the Roman Catholics have no problem with saying that you can be a charismatic Pentecostal Orthodox, you know, papal Christian. And then that's going to seep into, Catholic, into Orthodoxy if that's legitimate. I mean, it, we're going to be swallowed up. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't bat an eye. So what you're talking about is real. And it's not just real on the part of the of Catholicism, it's a, a part of the Cubanists in the Orthodox Church. They do not care or they don't understand how just how how what a chasm exists and how many problems are not being dealt with. Maybe they don't care. I don't know. And, and consider the spirit be, behind Pentecostalism, where it not only transcends denominations, it transcends Christianity. There's Pentecostalist Islam in Africa. So it's I I don't know. It's. I think Saint Irenaeus is very clear that it's demonic, but that's a whole other question. But it's an example of what you're talking about. I think. Let's yes. Do, let's, deal it, with it. Yeah. let's deal with it afterwards. We'll, we'll figure it out afterwards. You know, but I actually. That seems to be where, like, I here's where my suspicions are. But being someone who knows absolutely no one in the know, <laughs> that's all they are: suspicions. What if the Roman Catholic delegation comes and admits that the Orthodox are correct? They're not saying, let's look past each other. Or, let's not worry about this. They say, no, you're right about everything. And we will reinterpret all our past decrees according to the Orthodox mode. Council of Trent, Council of Florence, we're going to reinterpret all of them. So you tell, and to be exactly what you tell us what they should be. I think a lot of people in their YouTube channels would be jumping up and down as they made a union commence, right? It's, they're going to agree with us. Because this sounds more like a, sounds like more than a generous compromise. You're never going to be offered this much, and that's why I fear that this will be the tactic that'll be used because it's the most likely to work. Um, saying, "Yeah, we'll agree with everything with you." Now, my suspicions aside, when we reviewed the Chiatine Alexandria documents, this is, uh, and the same approach, by the way, is seen in the agreed statement on the Filioque, which I won't be covering. Both approaches, the look past each other approach, but also we'll reinterpret our Roman Catholic stuff to make it Orthodox. Both are followed. So most likely it'll be somewhere in the middle of those two ideas. Now, if the reinterpret everything approach is followed, what, pre what prevents the union from being reinterpreted and our own decrees from being decontextualized and mutated to be Roman Catholic or even something else over time, right? If they could do it, the same could happen to us because we're buying into it that it's possible. Right? If people could decontextualize their beliefs, then we will end up decontextualizing orthodoxy. And as you kind of referred to before, Father, that's already sort of occurring in the agreed statements of the Oriental Orthodox. So it seems to be that we could de uh, we decontextualize in order to try to get on the same uh, the same page with them. Hmm. Now, I think, I think that would be a very uh, politically speaking from a lot of the Roman Catholic world that that would be rather painless. Because that's not, they're not even familiar with a lot of that uh, in terms of the Orthodox understanding of those things, right? So, as long as Trent's still there and it's the, the papers, the document is still there and we're still ascribing to it, you know, most people are not going to really have a problem if there's a, a new interpretation. Oh, no. Yeah, exactly. They could carry on um, as they're carrying before. Now, I think for us to maintain 
our intellectual and spiritual integrity, we must um, maintain the importance of context in forming our understanding of meaning. I'm repeating this again and again and again. Orthodox must maintain that their counsels are correct and consistent with themselves and the patristic consensus, or in other words, sacred tradition. Hmm. Demanding we maintain the importance of context is a, is a simple but elegant solution, right? Decrees are not all that matters. Their intended meaning and consistency with the faith once and all delivered to the saints, as Jude 1.3 states, does matter. Hence, we cannot reinterpret our tradition or allow for a half-hearted acceptance. There needs to be repentance, not specifically of any given crime. You know, I'm sure no one there is going to be like mean people, but of multiple false doctrines and a false postmodernist epistemology. Roman Catholic, it's you need an orthodox ethos, right? <laughs> you need an orthodox <laughs> ethos to be orthodox. That's the point, right? So you need to channel it. The Roman Catholics must be comfortable with forfeiting their post-schism traditions and their post-schism ethos. And unless this occurs, the Orthodox by default will be counterfeiting their own. Mm, very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, the, the, this points to the dogma and ethos. They're inseparable. And so if you go that route, you're going you're gonna to be abandoning uh, eventually their own dogmas. I, I can't agree more. I'm still on this day.